Cool. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. So uh, first, just a couple quick introductions. My name's Chris. I'm the founder of PCBSD, and you may have seen me on such shows as uh, BSD Now. So uh, if you guys watch that, thank you. If not, you should be watching. So uh, check that out. <laughs> well, the cool thing about the show, if I don't give me a second for a little plug here, is a lot of the people we're interviewing is people in this room. And so you're going to see a lot of colleagues and familiar faces on there. And if you don't know a lot of people in this room, it's a great way to put a name with the face. So uh, definitely check it out. If anything, just for the interviews, maybe you're beyond the tutorials, but uh, the interviews are definitely good. But uh, today we're going to be here to talk about a package management and what we're currently hacking on with uh, PCBSD, FreeNAS, and for FreeBSD as well. And uh, I speak pretty quickly, but if you guys have questions, feel free to interrupt. I don't mind that at all. Just get a hold of me, get my attention, and we'll uh, stop and take a detour. So uh, as we get started, I first want to take a look back at kind of what brought us to this point, so the history of package management on PCBSD specifically. So it um, started back in 2005, gosh, 10 years now. So 10 years ago is when I started working on the PBI system, and I've given other talks about this in previous years. It was originally designed as a self-contained system, um, pretty much uh, user-friendly for desktops. We were going for more of a Mac or Windows model, trying to eliminate dependencies, shove everything in a directory, and have it do its thing. Um, this was accomplished by using some hacks to the port system and building things with custom prefixes and then some runtime hacks to make it all go. So over the years, the system worked pretty well. I mean, it was neat. Um, it, you know, succeeded at what I wanted at the time. You have to remember, this is all pre-package NG. So at the moment, there wasn't a lot of other options that would have worked for us. But, you know, as time went on, issues with it became apparent. Um, number one was that applications kept getting bigger. They have this annoying habit of, ooh, let's bring this dependency in. Oh, we grew this new feature, and feature creep hits everything. And uh, gosh, I remember when packaging Firefox was really simple, and it didn't bring in that much, right? <laughs> you know, and as a ports guy, like, this is, it's just universal, right? Packages and applications are growing, and then when Dbus showed up, everything went to hell, right? Okay, now we got Dbus involved here, too. So um, yeah, applications kept getting bigger, and that was annoying. Um, the applications started becoming much more interdependent on other applications to function, Dbus being a prime example of that. Like, oh, now I need to communicate with this and that, and the whole container thing wasn't working as well. And this made the runtime a heck of a lot more difficult, as you can imagine, because if I have Firefox in a container, well, what about plugins? How do I load Flash, or how do I load the Java plugin, or Ice-T, or whatever it is? Uh, your Silverlight hacked plugin, whatever the flavor was of the day you needed to run, it got more difficult to do that. Well, several years later, PackageNG showed up, and uh, we can all thank Baptiste for that, and um, it's been, you know, in my mind, very successful. And the need for PBIs became less and less important for us, right? PackageNG was maturing at a really rapid state, and I didn't feel like we had the need to continue doing our own thing. FreeBSD had uh, taken a different path, and it was time for us to unify. So, we were able to switch over and start using things like repositories, handling proper dependency tracking, and more. Again, there's some weaknesses with that, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, and what we're trying to do to solve that. But the main thing was we didn't want to diverge too much for, from FreeBSD. I've always been proud on the PCBSD side that we're not a fork. We're not out there just doing our own thing and hacking up the base and giving you some FrankenBSD. We wanted to be a FreeBSD desktop, so we did not want to diverge too much. This was very important to me anyway. So in the winter of 2014, so last year, we finally decided let's just scrap the old system and it's time to go full on, full blown package NG. At that point, it had matured enough to the point where I felt comfortable doing that to our users and I felt like for a desktop, it was ready to roll. So what ended up happening was the new PBI system became pretty much just a front end to package NG. So uh, the users will still see PBI referenced occasionally, but at this point, it's really just there to drive the Qt-based front end and uh, what we call the app cafe. But under the hood, it's all package ng black magic that's happening. So uh, nothing too surprising there. So today, the PBI system isn't actually any packages. It's just metadata. So the things we're sucking in is stuff to build pretty GUIs and do like screenshots and ooh, you might want to try this application because it's similar. You know, very app store type material is what our PBI system is. And it's just metadata. So part of the shift in this thinking was also we needed to reevaluate a little bit um, our old Qt4-based app cafe. And I have a picture here of what it looked like. And you know, for the time, it worked pretty well. You can see we have our different metadata here for things like user stars. You can choose uh, to rate things. And 
then we'll, we will then highlight them in our recommendations based on what the community feedback is. But uh, we noticed there's a trend you know, towards always on connectivity and we were seeing a lot of systems that were doing a lot of different things all in the same box. For example, desktops with jails running services. That was not uncommon. It turned out a lot of people running PCBSD are usually fairly technical, hacker type folks. And they're like, yes, but I'm running my Plex in a jail here and I'm running this over here. Oh, and I hacked something in the base system and here's an Nginx, right? So uh, that kind of changed our thinking a little bit on how we're gonna do package management. And it also meant to us that having something remotely accessible could be kind of cool. You know, not having to physically connect a monitor to the system, bring it up, and uh, always manage packages that way would be kind of neat. So uh, last year, 2014, we started a new project to convert the App Cafe for, uh, to a HTML5 driven front end to PBI and package ng. So uh, during the early days, I kind of sat down and just sketched out some goals. What are we trying to accomplish with this shift? So uh, we wanted, first of all, to create something which could be very useful for a variety of situations, not just desktops, but things maybe such as a FreeBSD or TrueOS server. So for those who don't know, TrueOS is just our PCBSD branded server. It's FreeBSD, but with our installer, boot environments, and all that. But we wanted something that could manage packages on that remotely. Of course, we still wanted to support the desktop, but guess what? There's appliances out there now, like FreeNAS. I'm sure you guys have all heard of FreeNAS, right? Surprisingly, lots of people like to run applications on their FreeNAS. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's a lot more people running apps, it seems, now than even storing files. Everyone wants, they put a file on there, but then they run some app because they want to serve that. So I need Plex Media Server. I need whatever the flavor of the day is. Uh, people running own cloud, for example and running web services in jails on, app, on appliances. So it was like, okay, how do we help people manage that as well? Because obviously an appliance doing storage is more interested in storage, not necessarily how you spin up own cloud. So uh, we also needed something which would function pretty much in an asynchronous manner. So we'll touch on that here in a moment. We wanted to allow you to hit all the major package functionality without ever dropping you to a shell prompt. So in my mind, if you have to hit the shell, we've failed. You should be able to do everything with click, 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 and done through a, you know, a computer, a web interface, or a phone as well. And we also wanted to support uh, creating and then managing the life cycle of your jails and the packages installed within those jails. And then uh, one of the things that uh, came up in some of the meetings we had at IX was how about configuration? So if you guys have done packages for a while and managed systems, you know, it seems like everyone has their own configuration syntax. Well, my comp files are here and they're in this format. Oh, but no, you need to edit ours here. Or maybe we have a web interface that lets you configure and everything's just kind of this mismatch. And if you don't know where the magic bits are, you know, you'll end up Googling trying to figure out, well, how do I just change the port this listens on? Or how do I you know, add a user or do whatever config uh, I need to do? So, we wanted something that was also very responsive and quick because package ng when you're building up repositories and looking through everything we needed to be fast like on my mobile i wanted to click and have answers immediately and of course we needed queuing so i wanted to be able to again on my phone maybe i'm in the car on the way somewhere i want to be able to set up a jail queue a task and say install some packages and you know i'll lose connection five miles down the road and away it goes yes Yeah. Um, are you going to have an option to actually go with that? So that, like, one of the things that I liked about, well, <laughs> the only thing I liked about Windows 2012 <laughs> is that when you're doing something, it echoes the PowerShell command out to you so that you sure. can actually get into that. Um, um, it doesn't echo anything back, but I'm going to show you kind of what it does look like and what it does in a few slides. So, uh, yeah, I'm hopefully I'll answer your questions there. But uh, as I was saying, queuing a task was important. I needed to be able to support somebody who's, again, on a phone or a mobile or may not want to sit and wait for a jail to get provisioned because you may queue up a jail and, oh, it's got to download 100 megs to build the jail. Oh, and it's got to download another 500 megs and load Java up or whatever to run your services in those jails. That takes time. And if you're coming on a mobile device, you don't want to sit there watching for it. You just want to queue that sucker up and let it go. So uh, the way we're doing that in the new App Cafe is we're using a bunch of different languages and technologies. Some of this may be changing in the next year. We're considering this kind of our experimental first run to see what we could do in this arena. 
So of course we're still using C++. Again, I'm a Qt guy, I'm a desktop guy, so I like C++. I do a lot with shell though, so most of the backend shell. Everyone groans when I say PHP. Yeah, that's probably one of the things that will go away in the future, but I knew PHP, so we started with that. And of course, a variety of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to do some of the interactive elements on the website. So the first piece of technology we had to come up with to start doing this was some way of keeping information about the state of the system and the state of your jail so it could have a responsive UI. So not every click results in a please wait, I'm looking in your jail to see what's available. Oh, are there updates to that? I mean, that can take minutes depending on how much data it has to pull down to do the check against the local database. So we came up with something called syscache, which uh, my brother Ken actually wrote here, but it's uh, implemented in Qt and it provides a persistent read-only cache of information that we can query extremely quickly via either the command line or PHP or we can uh, connect to it with uh, Qt as well. So it's written using Qt5's core lib so it doesn't suck in X11 and all those dependencies. It's actually a much smaller subset and uses the Qhash class which is fast for doing lookups of data. It pretty much monitors the state of all these on the system. It's going to monitor, first of all, system updates. At the moment, we're querying FreeBSD update because that's the method we use to keep our system and kernel up to date. And of course, it monitors PKG. FreeBSD update may be going away soon as soon as the packaging base lands. We're very excited for that. Um, it, of course, monitors all your package repo metadata. So that means the local copy, what's installed in the system, what's your state at at the moment. And what's available? What's out there in the wild that you could potentially download? And we're going to use that to build the UI. And then we load the extra metadata for the PBI system. That'll be the app cafe, all the pretty pictures and whatnot that the package guys, for some reason, don't care about. And that doesn't get put in the ports tree, which I understand. That's not the place for it. But we need to have some of those bits so it looks nice. And then, of course, jails. Like, we got to monitor your jails. What's enabled? What's inside the jails? Oh, are there upgrades available? That jail's a couple versions behind, so we need to provide a quick way to monitor that as well. Um, it uses, uh, for those who know Qt, it uses the Q file system watcher class, which will monitor changes to jails in the local system and then query updates to those specific bits. So if you uh, log into the system and do a PKG command by hand, we'll see that the database has been changed, something's been added or removed. We can then requery to make sure we have a consistent uh, state of your data. So this was initially designed to be used for this new app cafe we're going to talk about. But we found this is actually kind of cool. We have a lot of other utilities in PCBSD using it as well now. So we're not having to constantly hit the disk and see what's here, what's there, what's there. Syscache already knows. So it's be quickly becoming this monster that keeps track of everything on our system for us. So uh, using it's pretty simple. It's just a uh, syscache start sync. It'll manually start a system information sync. Usually you never call that because it's started by rc.descripts. And then we can have some commands I'll show here. There's a lot more, but things like has updates. Are there updates to the base system that will return true false? Do we need to reboot? Have we done an update? Are we waiting to reboot for some other reason? And then we have things like update logs. Like, OK, the system updated, but I want to see the plain text of what happened from FreeBSD update or package ng or whatever it happened to be doing. So the following syntax is how we retrieve information. I'm going to show the command line usage. But we have a system where we can pass in a whole bunch of arguments and say, give me this. I want to know what PKJ thinks of the system. And uh, local mail, I want to see the Thunderbird version that's locally installed, not what's available remotely. And we can chain all these together to do them in one really fast call. So give me the option, or give me the status of the remote mail mutt command. But hey, show me the options it was compiled with at the same time. So we can quickly chain things together and get answers back in a very quick amount of time for the web interface. So uh, the dispatcher is another piece of technology we wrote for this. This was written in shell. This is part of the asynchronous portion of the uh, user interface. It handles the following. So first of all, it does all your jail actions. So that's going to be the daemon that sits and says, OK, it's time to uh, start a jail. It's time to stop a jail. Ooh, we're going to do an upgrade. This is one which could take a while. So it's going to monitor and kick that off and keep it going and give us a result when it's done. It's also going to handle, of course, package installation and removal, um, either onto the base system or jail. And then it'll handle the application configuration as well, which I'll show the UI for in a moment. So in addition to that, this uh, dispatcher will handle some other local system tasks. Um, package add or move, of course, on the local system, the config, and then system updating via FreeBSD or PKG. 
Um, this is some, we have some configuration knobs where you can turn this off. So on an appliance like FreeNAS, for example, you don't want to expose that to the end user because they may not be using FreeBSD update or PKG. So the interface will just silently hide all that stuff so you can use their updating mechanisms. But for jails, we still want to expose that. And of course, it logs everything that was queued and gives you results. And it handles user authentication to make sure you have permission to change stuff on the system. So this uh, utility is written entirely in shell. It performs all the user and password authentication with PHP, which we'll uh, show here in a moment. Uh, passwords are stored using PHP's password hash functionality. And then it, of course, generates random uh, session keys, which are passed back to the client. So you can uh, continue to work on your session until you time out or log out. It stores most of its internal files are going to be in var temp uh, app cafe. That's cleared out after each restart, so don't place anything important there. Um, some of the files we store in there, of course, is going to be the dispatcher ID. That's going to be the session key of the, the users who are logged in. And then we have a, a results file of things that have been queued. It's a summary, which will give you just a quick status of this is what's happened on the box. We have a working queue. These are the things that are queued up and are waiting to be run. And then we'll have a logs directory, which will have a log of everything it's done. Like, I believe in capturing every bit of output possible. So if PKG barfs on something, I want to know why and not have to go run the command again. I can look at it in the interface. So inside the, uh, the um, summary file, we'll have uh, just a list of success and then a unique hash. And this is what was happening. We were doing a PBI install of games, or actually a delete in this case, on the system. And there'll just be a whole bunch of entries like that. And then the hash will correspond to something in the logs directory where you can go look up the gory details if you're interested or if our UI wants to look it up. So what does this look like at the moment? Well, this is where we're at with it right now with uh, PCBSD 10.1.2, which released uh, last month. We do quarterly updates. We actually made this the default. So this is live and running in production right now. What's going on here is we have a QT front end, but that's actually WebKit and it's all a web interface at this point. So you can bring up the same thing on your Firefox. Um, so the front end, it's made up of a couple different components. We have, of course, the WebKit viewer, because people still want to have something to browse in. We don't want to require you to install Firefox or some other browser. We can do something really lightweight. We're using Nginx to serve that. And then, of course, PHP is handling the heavy lifting. It's served over HTTPS, and we create a self-signed certificate. The first time you start it, you can provide a fully signed one if you'd like. There's configuration knobs for that. Um, the first time you start it from the desktop, it's going to prompt you for the pseudo password for your local user, the same as the old App Cafe did. We want to make sure you're you and you have uh, permission to access this. On PCBSD, that means you're a part of the operators group. If you take somebody out of that group, they have no access to add or remove packages on the system. So FYI. So uh, with all the persistent stuff happening in the syscast and dispatcher, now all the UI elements are actually rendered on the fly. When you click, it's querying and building up the UI user interface for each uh, page you've requested. This is allowing us to queue all the actions and then closing or disconnecting the app cafe while actions still continue. I can come back later now and see what happened. I don't have to watch stuff. And uh, with it being HTML5, we've also included a mobile-friendly theme. So again, on my nice little Galaxy Note here, I can connect to it and have a mobile theme where I can just click, 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 and OK, I have a jail set up. Done. Here you go. And there, oh, I installed some packages in there too. I don't even have to be at a computer in the office. So um, using the, all the metadata we have, it's able to provide a little bit more advanced control over the installed applications. Um, of course, we have uh, facilities to do services, so you can start, stop, enable, or disable services both on the live system or in the jail. And then we're going to talk about application configuration management a little further. So I'm just going to kind of use an example here. So Biddleby, who's used this before? Does anyone know what this is? You've used it. So it's the, uh, you've used it too, okay. So it's an IRC gateway, so you have basically an IRC bot that sits there and connects you to you know, other networks like Jabber or whatever or Twitter, or yeah, whatever it is. It's pretty cool. So that was something I was like, oh, I'll make a service for this real quick. So in this case, you can see when you bring up the Biddly page, it's installed. It looks like it's running because it says I can stop or restart it. But oh, there's a configuration tab. So we were able to expose this into the user interface. So Biddleby was the first one I picked because it had relatively few options you had to set, and it was really fast and easy to prototype. But uh, basically, we're able to provide some of the Biddleby options and expose it here. 
So of course, ports, passwords, you know, authorization mode, how it's supposed to run, and then uh, you can save those, and that ends up getting spit off into whatever Biddleby's config file is. So how do we do that? So to manage services, this is where the PBI metadata comes in because we didn't have all this information in the port structure, so we added it to the PBI system. So we'll have a service start file, which will just give us some variables, what the name is, what the RC script is, and then we have a type, which we'll call primary or secondary. And primary is something we expose to the GUI and we'll get an actual buttons and knobs. A secondary is something that needs to be on, but we don't necessarily want to expose to the UI. So sometimes there might be dependencies of something where we'll just have that running, but the primary will show up in the UI. So to do the configuration UI, which is the fun part, we have a, a config file in the metadata with uh, PHP entries for the menu items, which I apologize, it's kind of all cluttered here. But we've basically just created an array. Again, this is a, a prototype at the moment. But uh, we've created an array and we list the, the UI elements here. So combo box. If anybody's done QT or web forms, you know what a combo box is, a drop down. And then we're going to give it a description. We're going to give it a long description. So if they hover the mouse over or want to see more details, they can find out more about what this option does. We then set a key. We set the default of what it should be or what it was when we shipped it. And then we start providing options. And those will all be propagated into the user interface. Yes? Yeah, it was quick and dirty. That's exactly why. Uh, it's, um, honestly, I didn't have a UCL parser, and I'm, I'm not a big UCL guy. So at some point, when we go back and start rewriting bits of this, that's probably what's going to end up happening, is some UCL or JSON type goodness. But um, again, it was PHP, and I knew that really quick and was able to prototype it very rapidly. So. OK, so another example would be maybe a number box. So the bit will be, what port are we running on? So we only want numbers in this case. And we're going to go ahead and say, I want a description here, long description. What's the range of ports maybe we can run for? Each type will have some different config options that are documented in the readme that you could uh, provide the user interface. So with all these options provided, the App Cafe can basically create the UI elements and then call the PBI scripts directory to set and get variables. So we'll have a couple scripts where we say, I want to get a config. Here's the key. Get me the value of this, uh, this key in the file. I want to set a value here, so here's the key, here's the value. And then we have a done config, which we can call afterwards. So for example, some applications we may want to set five options and then do some master command to reset it or, or apply those in some fancy way. Again, applications have a ton of different ways they do their configs, so we tried to provide functionality for all of them. So enabling the system is actually pretty easy. Of course, if you grab PCBSD or TrueOS, it's turned on by default. So it's uh, very easy to use, although TrueOS will prompt you if you want it on or not. So for FreeBSD, we actually have it in the package system already. So you can just grab uh, sysutils, we call it PCBSD AppWeb, and uh, that's ready to go on FreeBSD uh, 10 and whatnot at the moment, whatever it built on in the cluster. And starting, it's real simple. You start the syscache daemon, which is sucked in automatically as a dependency, and you just start the app cafe. And of course, the related service commands to start those. So setting a password, we have a command we ship called app cafe set pass. You'll just provide it a username and password, and that sets up your remote access so you can connect on your, your you know, remote phone or web browser. So accessing the interface, um, it has a port in there. So it might be 8885 or whatever. You'll just access that over HTTPS, whatever your IP address is, and then it brings up the UI in your web browser. And of course, accessing the interface locally on the desktop, if you want our WebKit viewer, we have that also. That's the PCBSD Utils QT5 package. And you would just run the command app cafe or PC soft web. It would start the QT container and uh, show you your interface. Yes? What could we use for authentication? So um, for authentication, what we're going to do is with sudo, on the local system, well, it, does, it works differently. So on the local system, sudo is going to call in, verify that the password match, and then return a key. OK, you're, you're locally authenticated. Yes, it'll, no, 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 it'll bring up a pseudo, we have a QT pseudo utility shipped as well, which will then pop up and prompt you for your once password. Once it's running on port 8885, yes. how do you ensure that only... There's a random key which is assigned back to the user, which is stored in the WebKit session and lost the moment you close the WebKit. 
and that would be the same with remote. So the remote will actually bring up a login, username, and password, and assuming you have the right one, it will then assign the random key back, which is stored using p some PHP functionality. So, Yeah, the local one was a little tricky trying to figure out how we were gonna do that, because like, the remote was easy. PHP has all this functionality to do that. We are like, well, we wanna work with sudo and not have to go through the web, but we did manage to do that, and it, it does work. All right, so settings are actually located in appcafe.conf in the usual locations, user local Etsy. And uh, we have the option where you can turn on or off remote because obviously if you're on a local desktop, you don't want to expose the port and leave that running if you don't care about remote interface. So you would set that to true if you want to enable that. Um, and then of course you can change the ports. You could turn off SSL if you want, if for whatever reason you don't want to serve it over that. Um, we also have the mode so you can specify how do we want the app cafe to appear? And this is gonna change how it renders. So desktop mode, for example, is gonna provide you full access to everything, local system packages and jails on the system. We have a server mode, which will provide you full access to all packages and jails, but it actually filters out all the XORG stuff. So you won't start getting all these XORG apps showing up in the app cafe, which is kind of convenient because nine times out of 10, I don't want those. And then appliance mode is even more restricted, which will only allow you to do operations on jails. It won't even show the base system, show any of the packages there. It just says you have these five jails. What would you like to do today with these? And of course, uh, we ship with it set to desktop on PCBSD, server on TrueOS, FreeNAS would ship with something turned on to appliance. So um, what are some of the differences? I know a lot of you guys have probably used PKG at this point. So um, most of the commands we're using are typical. There's no scary black magic here. We're doing things like adds, deletes, queries, our queries, updates, upgrades, et cetera. However, we do something a little special with the upgrade command, which I wanna just touch on briefly here. So we had a lot of problems with that. How many of you guys have done package upgrades, first of all? How many have used it? Okay. How many of you have had SAT solver issues? Okay, just about everyone <laughs> and the first time, okay. Not since 1.5, that is good. It's gotten better. Only since 1.5, see? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, see? Okay, so picture this. You're running a desktop and we ship a desktop, for example, and we provide access to, we'll say, 20 to 24,000 packages, right? However many it is. Desktop users tend to do weird things. They install certain things. They tend to upgrade only certain things or not upgrade certain things. And it drove our, the SAT solver nuts. We were seeing constant failures in PCBSD when people would go to upgrade from one version to another or just update to a more recent package set. Depending on what bits they had changed and what packages were installed, you know, things could fail. It happens. You know, it's not, it's just the nature of the beast, especially when users start locking things and whatnot. It gets pretty hairy. So um, anyway, we needed something a little more automated because again, we're a desktop. My parents run this. I don't want to have to run over to their house and fix a SAT solver bug because ooh, it tried to install something that they had that, uh, anyway, I had to do that a couple times. That's what prompted this. So um, the updater in PCBSD operates a little bit differently now. So first of all, it's gonna take a look at what's installed on your system and then prefetch all the required packages it's going to create a new boot environment or a jail clone if we're operating on a jail. It's gonna mount the new boot environment. It's gonna shroot into it and clean out all the old packages. Just wipe it completely out, okay? It's then going to reinstall from the prefetch packages, but the installation targets are only the packages upon which nothing else depended, i.e. the top level packages that you installed, not the dependencies, okay? And by doing that, what we found is we've not had any conflicts or SAT solver issues because those just suck in the required dependencies. Those were all prefetched, and we're not trying to go back and upgrade some dependency on PHP, which is weird now, and something has broken. Okay? And again, this is all done on a live running system in a cheroot. And when we're done, assuming everything has gone successfully, nothing has failed, we will just you know, mark the new boot environment as the default. And then, of course, if you're on the desktop, you get a nice little pop-up saying, hey, reboot me at some point, and your updates are done. Like, at that point, we're finished. Or it'll say you need to restart the jail so you're on the new version of the jail. Um, we have found this works really stinking well. It's actually really convenient in the morning to see that an update's running and going, oh, but I have VirtualBox running and stuff's happening and I'm compiling and I don't want to reboot to get these updates, which I want to run, but whatever. I can just let it run. It'll prompt me to reboot, and I'll say, that's fine. Go away for a couple hours. I'll reboot later. 
and it, it's great. It never touched a single thing on my running session. So uh, we've had great success with that, so much so that we turned it on by default in PCBSD. So we're auto-updating systems now, and uh, the last major update we did, even going from a 10.0 to 10.1 on my folks system, like I went over to their house, and they're like, oh yeah, it just updated the other day, no big deal. Right, they're running on the new version, new KDE, new everything, right? And I was like, this is finally we've reached the point where I, I did not get a call to come over and fix something, <laughs> right? So this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I feel your pain. I run a free BSD desktop too, so these are the things we're trying to solve. But that's the only real black magic we're doing that's different from your standard PKG usage. So uh, that's what's happening under the hood. It depends entirely on what you have installed. So obviously, if you have two gigs of packages installed, it's going to need two more additional gigs to build that. Um, by default, we set ours to keep three boot environments, so they start discarding the old ones. So we'll always have three available on the system. Um, what we found, though, is we keep a cache of the packages as well. So we're not re-downloading the whole two gig set every time. It may only be 10 packages that changed in the new set. So we're only fetching those 10 new packages, they're in the cache, and then we can rebuild your boot environment from there. Um, yeah, and because the boot environments are just clones, and it just, it just works really well. We might even have to turn on dedupe at some point. Yes? So since most of the most horrendous ports like Plex have been fixed, mm -hmm. um, I've not had issues with the package upgrade and then the package auto load. Sure. Sure. Not doing the auto remove stuff does sometimes break it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if a policy that would work is to assume that anything that auto remove can remove is fine to do mm -hmm. only from or uninstalling other stuff. That's possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So one of the things we want to expose to the UI soon, we've turned off auto remove because we had some issues with it early on in early days. But it's gotten to the point now where I think we're going to turn that back on. Ah, there's still issues, he says. With 1.6, he says. Okay, so when he says it's safe to do it, we will turn that on, probably to our fault. What I was hoping to do, actually, is expose it to the UI. So when you delete a package, it'll say, here's the list of what we could auto-remove. Speaking of which, BAP, could you add that as a feature? When you, when you say, I want to delete Firefox, give me some flag that says you could also delete these with auto-remove at the same time, and then I can show that in the UI and say, you can remove Firefox, do you also want to clean up? Does it provide the list ahead of time, or do you have to run it after you've deleted Firefox? I don't know. Okay, I don't well. Remember. Anyway, that, that's what I want to get to the point is where it's like. I, I, we've talked a lot about this. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't remember. If, well, a lot of people have asked for this. I don't remember if they're going to okay. <laughs> but, but, it on a, on a future request. Well, that's the goal where I'd like it to be is like I've installed Plex into a jail, but I want to remove it now. Okay, well, do you want to clean up these at the same time? And it just does it all in one sweep is, is the plan. Did you have a question, sir? Are there any OpenBSD guys in here we could ask? So you only want package or PKG or? Well, the whole app, app, app thing keeps God, it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it's, uh, admittedly, I suck at CSS, so it doesn't look as awesome as I'd like it to look. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully someday a CSS guy will come around and make it look awesome. Well, honestly, this is Debian. Apps get this up today. Sure. <laughs> well, no, the, the, all the web stuff is not, unless you're using the WebKit viewer, you're doing this all through your phone. So, yeah, and it has a nice mobile interface. I've been pretty pleasantly surprised with it. Okay, darn, you got to stay on FreeBSD or PCBSD. Okay. <laughs> but uh, so, 
the one thing that allows us to do a lot of this with all the upgrades and stuff is all ZFS. So we went to ZFS only a couple years back, right? 64-bit only, ZFS only. And this is just some of the cool new things we're starting to come up with because we have all that functionality under the hood. Yeah? So one thing that I managed to crash a Debian system with uh -oh. is, app is dynamically linked. Mm -hmm. And you say app get whatever the command is. Sure. Sure. And then eventually you can, none of these have an option that is just do it. Sure, sure. You eventually end up with a version of app that doesn't link with your libc. That, yeah, that would suck and ruin your day, wouldn't it? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so one trick, one trick we do do. So we use, yeah. We have a slightly different view about it. Backwards compatibility, yeah. Well, so one trick we're doing is we actually use the package static binary. When we clean the, the boot environment, we remove PKG as well, but we preserve, um, we grab the package static out of the new package that's going to be installed and use that to bootstrap us. So that's how we go from, say, 10.1 to 11 current, which, by the way, we are running monthly current images now at PCBSD. So if you'd like, thank you. But it all uses this updater. We've had people running it for the last four or five months and just going from May to June, and it just upgrades. You get all new packages, and it does all this magically. And guess what? You can roll back if something goes wrong. So that is pretty cool. But uh, it does do some package static stuff to avoid potential conflicts there. But of course, you know, why did we do this? Um, I already mentioned a lot of this, so I'll just kind of blow through these. But we wanted background updating. I didn't want to defer doing updates because I was working. In other words, when VirtualBox is running, doing a compile because I'm building something, the last thing I want to do is start you know, twiddling around my packages and potentially remove something and mess up my day. So we wanted to be able to do that in the background. Of course, we wanted to avoid potential conflicts with running package upgrade. And uh, we never wanted to touch your working good environment. In other words, when I do an upgrade, I want to be certain that what I'm running on right now has not been touched in any way. So if I do need to roll back, no, you're not rolling back to some hacked up part way, you know, this was kind of touched during the upgrade. No, it's pristine and never been uh, messed with. Yeah? What about programs that try to give you the local option again? The right to use, yeah, that's a little iffy, all right? So we're not seeing a whole lot of programs that write to user local, so we're not running into issues with that. What we preserve, it's based on your data sets that you set up during install. So on PCBSD, user local is part of the boot environment. Um, the things that are kept outside of the boot environment would be slash root, of course, all the home directories, some stuff in temp, so you have logs and whatnot that persist. And uh, there can be an issue if you go and start making changes in user local that won't persist in the new boot environment, obviously. So we've had to put some notes in there like, hey, if you're going to make changes, do it after you've done the update. After creation? Yeah, so you do the package update, you create the mm -hmm. um, thing, and then you just don't mount it, rewrite it. So if someone really explicitly wants to yeah. write stuff, they can remount it. Or you that would be a little hairy. I'm not sure. Um, you could create a yeah. separate user local var. Yeah, yeah. Which is not part of the boot. That would probably be, the, I would almost do user local var instead if we're going to do that. And we may already create that. I'd have to look at our data set list to see what exactly it is still. But I know user local bin and related suspects are all part of the data set or the boot environment. So, and obviously we did this because I just want something that works and I'm tired of touching systems. Just update me, act like an appliance. So availability. So as I mentioned, this is all out now. It's in PCBSD Intro OS 10.1.2, which came out in May. So you, I'm running this right here. You can grab it now. Of course, it's in the current images as well. So current images, as we consider that, our bleeding edge, just like FreeBSD, that's their bleeding edge. So you'll have all that in the June snapshot that came out a couple days ago. And as I mentioned, it's in the ports tree. And looking ahead, so obviously I said this was kind of a proof of concept. Can we do this as the technology to the point where we can make all these bits happen? So now that we've kind of done it and we're using it in production, where do we want to go from here? So as I mentioned, we want to do some cool stuff with auto-remove, saying, hey, you're going to remove this. Do you want to clean up after yourself? I suck at CSS, so <laughs> some better theming would be nice. Some more ajax -y type interaction in the UI would be kind of cool, but I'm not a web developer. Maybe I'm too old or something. I don't know, but like the kids these days do all kinds of crazy stuff. 
with Ajax. I'd like to have some more interaction with running processes so you can view the logs as it's happening, you know, blow it up in an ajax -y type window and it's interactive and all that would be cool. And uh, being able to interact and interrupt some of the uh, non-asynchronous commands would be nice. So one thing we're looking at is getting rid of PHP. And since we already have the daemon in Qt, doing something Qt-ish to actually serve it. Qt, believe it or not, has web server stuff in it now where it can serve HTML and all that. So we're experimenting and looking at that at the moment to see if we can drop Nginx and PHP and not need those bits anymore. Um, another thing that's interesting, this is a recent development, we've had the Warden utility in PCBSD for a while, but we've decided to drop it in favor of IOCage. So for those, has anybody here, first of all, used IOCage, besides Peter, who's one of the authors of that? All right, one, you really should try it. It's quite, quite awesome. It's like somebody, I don't know, Peter, it's, it's all ZFS. It does everything with ZFS properties. It's like what I would have wanted Warden to be if I had started it now. Like, this is really cool. So was very happy to switch to that. Um, we're going to have support for IO cage uh, base jails, which if you've come from an easy jail background, you're already familiar with how that works. But instead of all the nullfs trickery, it's ZFS commands instead. We're also experimenting with some new Docker-like functionality for downloading and deploying images. So you have the option of not using package in the jails. You can instead have pre-built images. You can commit to, push to some repo somewhere, and then deploy it on your servers or in the cloud somewhere, wherever it happens to live. So some of the changes we've made to IOCage have been relatively minor so far, just mostly relating to some non-interactive stuff, and I've committed those upstream. Um, just some improvements so we can fetch stuff from like the PCBSD repo because we have obviously current images now which have their own dist files that maybe aren't up on the FreeBSD mirrors. And uh, that's actually it. That's where we're going. So I have a link to the slides here, but before I close, are there any questions, guys? Or have we asked them all during, which is fine. Yes? Okay. Sure. Um, but Jeff Matson has an entire chapter in his book about why simple interfaces and expert interfaces are a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is you know, a problem that I found with Drake when I started commuting it mm -hmm. way back. But you have this user interface that lets you do the things that you do commonly. Mm -hmm. And that lets you do 90% of what you want to do. Yeah. And it doesn't help you learn anything. So this is true. Sure. Maybe change these variables. On your way to that, you're looking at some of the other things. So we're kind of doing some of that with, not necessarily with the config elements, although I probably sh could expose more of that, with all the package commands we are. So for example, in the app cafe, I didn't show it here, but if you do a task and then go look, click on the log, you get a listing of this is what I ran to propagate this jail. This is what commands, what flags, everything that was passed in. So you can you know, evaluate that and hopefully learn a little bit and maybe become a PKG god someday, right, is the plan. Or, or IO cage or whatever the command happened to be it was running. You'll see exactly what it did so it's not a black box and there's no mysteries. The config stuff, it's in PHP at the moment, which may be going away. So that's why I, I haven't been too concerned with it because I know that's possibly just beta stuff that we're going to toss and replace with something more elegant. But that's something I will definitely put on the roadmap. I agree. It should be cool to kind of walk the user through, these are the things we ran to adjust your config. But beta testing stuff, if you move to ECL, it would be nice to just yeah. have the ECL structure of the config file displayed and not something that you can't change. That would be cool. Hey, Ken, does Qt do UCL parsing now, or is it just JSON? I don't know. I'd have to look. I know they have JSON out of the box. I didn't do it. OK. Um, but UCL has the okay. parser. Oh, there you go. So so there's in a fact, you could probably um, write a backend to convert to a Q variant pretty easily. Oh, yeah. Very easily. Yeah, that would, that would be cool. Yeah, and then hopefully our syscache daemon could just output all those options in UCL and whatnot, and you could get that even from the command prompt if you need the UCL. So. And that would be kind of a nice selling point for, hey, if you config the way FreeBSD is doing yeah. it, because if you say, if your config trials are in UCL, then tools like AppCafe can just understand Sure. Automatically. That, awesome. that is definitely, we're putting that on the roadmap for 2.0 as of right now. So <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Hey, Ken, make that work. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, no pressure at all. So anyway, thank you guys so much for coming, and uh, I'll be around. So if you have any other questions, come on and help me down. So thank you guys.